I went to Israel in 2016 with the church led by Cliff and Wendy Morris. It was the trip of a lifetime for me. I felt like I wanted to be a sponge and just soak up everything I could about the experience. We went from the Dead Sea all the way up to the Sea of Galilee and beyond. Saw the Jordan River, was baptized in the Jordan River. That was a, a special experience for me. The Sea of Galilee, to be on a boat out there where Jesus was with his disciples, and that was peaceful. Uh, but you could see how the storms could come up quickly on a sea like that just by seeing the landscape. Bethlehem, to see the spot where the nativity happened and the surrounding area uh, when we were outside of the city, rolling hills, landscape you could see for miles. I can envision the shepherds out there at night, ordinary night, and all of a sudden the angels are there just lighting up the, the countryside. What a sight that must have been. That um, was special to me too, to envision that. We saw Caesarea Philippi, that's on beyond Galilee, where there was a lot of pagan worship, and you could see the tall cliffs where they sacrificed their children, throw them off the mountainside to, to this river that was down below, and their idols still in, engraved and carved in that block there. To be in Jerusalem, being up there on the Temple Mount, the mixture of Christians and Jews and Muslims, you feel the tension there. And that was, that was intriguing to me to experience as well. There's more than, more than I can express, more than I can, can say. Um, I would encourage you to go. It makes a world of difference when you're reading the Bible and you can envision these places where these things happened. You've been where, where Jesus walked. But the Bible is true. The trip just brings that home. It was the trip of a lifetime for me. Good morning. So good to be here with you in the house of the Lord as we focus our minds and hearts on the Lord. Uh, I want to begin just by welcoming folks to our service this morning. If you're a guest, we are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us. Do us a favor, if you will, and fill out this welcome card that you find in the pew rack in front of you. You could put some information on the back. It's just a way for us to get to know you better. Um, and there's some information as well you might want to know, like where's the bathroom and things like that. So you could check out that card here, if you will, and uh, fill that out and put it in the giving boxes in the back, if you will. Um, of course, we have Next Steps cards for those who are considering being members of our church. That's there for you as well. The Israel trip, it's coming up. It's coming up fast. And I want to encourage you, if you have not registered for this trip, that you go ahead and do it soon because after the 17th, we're going to open it up to the community and we're going to fill up this trip pretty fast, I think. And we are reserving spots for our, our members of our church. Um, and so I'm going to encourage you to register. If you don't know how to register, I want to encourage you to attend a meeting that's going to be this Tuesday night at 7 o'clock in the Salt Sunday School classroom. And there we're going to share... Uh, uh, updates and informational updates uh, concerning the trip. We're going to have some snacks from Israel you can sample. We're going to have a question and answer time. We're Zooming in uh, one of the, the leaders of the group that's taking us uh, on that trip. And we're just really excited about that. I encourage you to attend that informational meeting this Tuesday night at 7 o'clock. And I know that there's going to be somebody that's going to say, hey, listen, uh, I, I, I just haven't gotten around to doing this. I want to encourage you to seriously pray and consider going on this trip. I am convinced that it's going to really impact you spiritually if you're willing to attend. So I want to encourage you to do that. A few other things. We have something to celebrate this morning. You probably aren't aware of unless you happen to walk by this little glass box over here. But in that box, along with all of the white ping pong balls with initials on it, those are 
Those are people, if you don't know, that we're praying for that we know are not believers or that we're not sure if they are believers. We just have our members put initials so that nobody knows who they are on those ping pong balls and they turn them in in their Sunday school classes. We collect them. So that's the white ping pong balls. But as of this morning, we have three green balls. Those are people who our folks have been praying for their salvation, who in the last week or two have accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. Amen? You will see as well that there are two blue balls. That means two of those three have been baptized. In fact, this morning, that third ball person, a child that attends Liberty Baptist with uh, his his, uh, parents, um, uh, that child was baptized this morning. So three saved, three baptized that we have been praying for. Amen? Amen. Amen. The Acts 1-8 strategy, that, that, that emphasis, it's really not an emphasis, it's a strategy of our church, is meant for us to think purposefully about those who need to know the love of God in Jesus Christ so that we can be praying for them. So let me take a second here. I will do this in just a second. I want us to thank God for the souls that have been saved and ask for even more of a harvest to come out of our prayer efforts. But I want to mention one last announcement, and that's Financial Peace University. It starts next Sunday. If you know somebody who uh, could use a little help, basic things like how do you handle debt, how do you make a family budget, and so forth and so on, you need to attend this uh, class. It will help you as a family to get a hold on your debt, learn how to give up debt, to no longer be enslaved to the borrower, and to experience freedom financially. I want to encourage you that that class begins next Sunday night at 6 p.m. It's not too late for you to register. Please see the staff or call the office to do so. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and let's thank him for these souls that have been saved. Lord God, we know you called us to be a missionary people, a gospel-centered church that's a great commission church that deploys our people into your mission field, this community. Father, we've been praying for the lost, and Lord, we just call out to you and ask that you would continue to show mercy to those who may not know you as their Savior and their Lord. Father, we thank you for this three who have come to faith in Christ, that they've been baptized in the congregations that they're attending. Lord, we're just so grateful, Lord. We, we know and praise you. We know it's not about our church. It's not about people joining our church, being baptized in our baptistry, but it's about people being joined to you, becoming part of the kingdom. This is a kingdom work. God, we praise you for what you've done. We pray for more souls to be saved. And we pray it in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's an encouragement to hear uh, those numbers, those who we've been praying for, those who have accepted Christ as our personal Lord and Savior. Um, Each week, we gather together to sing our faith and to hear God's word proclaimed. When we sing our faith, we confess that true faith is a sure knowledge whereby we accept as true all that God has revealed to us in his word. At the same time, It is a firm confidence that to every person, God has granted forgiveness of sins, everlasting righteousness, and salvation out of mere grace, only for the sake of Christ's merits. This faith, the Holy Spirit, works in our hearts by the gospel. We see this in Ephesians chapter 2. It says, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. 
and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. As we sing together this morning, we sing the wonderful truth that God's amazing grace not only offers salvation, but it secures it. A salvation not based on anything we could ever hope to do, but based solely through Christ's redemptive work on the cross. What a joy it is to come together and to sing of God's amazing grace. Let's stand together as we sing. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory. The King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth With holy thunder Who leaves us breathless In awe and wonder The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love
continue to sing of what our Redeemer has done for us. I will sing. you may be seated.
1 Peter 1, it says, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. This morning we sing of the living hope. We sing the gospel story how Christ took on flesh to ransom us. As this first verse says, how great the chasm that lay between us, how high the mountain I could not climb. It's only because of what Christ has done that we can have a right relationship with God the Father. And we have an amazing hope in Him. Let's stand this morning as we sing. How great the chasm that lay between us. Dismiss our children to children's worship. We sing, Who could imagine? Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to where my sin and bear. The cross has spoken. The, the cross has spoken. I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my Lord.
this morning for his amazing grace and his great faithfulness. dedicate this time to you. We want to thank you first and foremost for your grace and your faithfulness to us. Lord, we know, we admit, we confess to you that we sin. We fall short so often, but we cling to the gospel. We cling to your grace. We cling to your son and his atonement on the cross, and we trust in your goodness, your faithfulness to us, and we praise you, and we dedicate this time to you in the name of Jesus Christ, we pray it. Amen. You may be seated. You can be turning with me to Luke chapter 4. We continue our sermon series, Snapshots from Luke's Journey. And I want to talk to you this morning about God's plan for our lives. God's plan for our lives. While you're turning there, 
I want to tell you a story. This is a story that was in the news back in 2016 about an organ woman. Uh, her name, I want to get this right, her name was Erin Hatsey. Hatsey. And she lived in Portland, Oregon. And one morning she got up to go to work and she walked out in the driveway to where her car should be. And her old red Subaru was missing. So she went back inside and she looked at the surveillance video and she discovered that the evening before a woman had calmly walked up to her car, opened it, somehow started the car and drove away. And so of course she did the only thing she could do. She reported it to police and police put out a little APB on that old red Subaru. The funny thing is, that the next morning, the police stopped that same woman driving that same old Subaru back into the driveway where it came from. And she explained what happened. Her friend had an old red Subaru and had sent her to the neighborhood to pick up her car, but she had mistakenly taken Aaron's car instead. It turns out that in some models of those old Subarus, that the keys are interchangeable and they'll actually start other engines. And so gladly, Aaron got her car back, right? But isn't that funny how sometimes mistakes can be made? Misunderstandings can happen, right? It reminds me of when a child, you know, wakes up on Christmas morning and they see the largest Christmas gift under the tree. And they, they think it's for them until they look at the tag and they realize, oh, it's for one of my siblings, right? <laughs> something like that. Or maybe you walk up to somebody in a crowd and, and you walk up to them from behind and you tap them on the shoulder only to discover you don't know this person at all. You thought they were who you knew, but they weren't, right? Well, these kinds of assumptions, of misunderstandings can be surprising. They can be disappointing or embarrassing. But our passage this morning warns us that some assumptions... And some misunderstandings can cause us to miss out on God's plan for our lives. Let's read Luke chapter 4. We're going to read verses 14 through verse 30. Beginning in verse 14. Scripture says, Luke records, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. And news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrollingly, unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up that, the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son? They asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself and you will tell me, do here in your hometown what, I, what, you, what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut up for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. 
All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town, and took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. May God bless the reading of the word this morning. Again, this is Luke's gospel that he writes. And in the beginning of Luke 4, he begins the chapter by saying that Jesus is filled with the Holy Spirit. He's filled with the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? That means, if you remember the sermon from last week, that Jesus is God's messianic agent ushering in the kingdom of God through God's people, but that he has chosen in his humanity, in the incarnation, to be totally dependent upon and yielded to the Holy Spirit. Our passage shows the very beginning of Jesus' ministry in Galilee and that he ministers how? He ministers in the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus was Holy Spirit empowered to do what he did, just as we should be Holy Spirit empowered to live a life that pleases the Lord. Jesus was being guided by the Spirit, enabled by the Spirit, just as we should be guided and enabled by the Holy Spirit today. Now, it talks about his preaching and teaching ministry. This is very, very important. And it says that he was being praised by all men. People loved his preaching ministry. And you need to understand that Jesus was really the first of the celebrity pastors. He really was, the celebrity preachers. You know, this is before TV and, and all of that. He was a celebrity in his preaching. You can think of it this way. He was the, the topic of conversation uh, in the community. So when people were sitting around the table, they would say, hey, did you hear what, what Jesus did in Capernaum? Or when the ladies were down by the river and they were, they were wetting the clothes and beating their clothes against the rock. That's what they had prior to the washing machine, right? When they were, what would they talk about? They'd say, hey, did you hear what, what Jesus said in his sermon at Chorazin? I mean, Jesus was a topic of everyday conversation. He literally was a celebrity in that area. Now, verses 14 through 15 are a description of Jesus's early ministry, and it's bookended by the reaction of the inhabitants of his hometown, Nazareth, that's found in verses 28 through 30. Luke has literally structured this passage so that it points us to Jesus' message and points us back to Jesus' message, and and the choice that the people in his hometown have made in this passage. He's telling us that the most important part of this, of this part of his gospel is Jesus' message to God's people. Now, Luke records in several other places that Jesus is preaching in the synagogue. I mean, it says it here that he was preaching in the synagogues. We, we see him in synagogues and other scenes in the gospel of Luke. But this is the only time that his sermon in a synagogue is recorded. Do you realize that? This is the only time specifically in the Gospel of Luke that it is recorded. What is Luke saying? Luke is saying that this message is programmatic for Jesus. In other words, that this is Jesus laying out his agenda as the Messiah. If you and I are to understand Jesus' ministry, his message It's this passage we need to understand. That's why we're going to study it this morning. Because it's that integral. It's that important. What we see here is that people from Jesus' hometown initially embraced Jesus and his message. Well, until they fully understand what his mission is going to be all about. Now, I want to point out three things that we can learn from this passage. I think that will help us. Uh, to understand what Jesus is saying and what it means for us today. And the first is this. I just want to say it this way. I don't know any other way to say it. Popularity is overvalued. It just is. You see that in verse 16. It was a custom of Jesus to attend synagogue each 
Sabbath day. Now, this shouldn't surprise us because if you remember in Luke chapter 1, Luke records that story of Jesus staying behind when the caravan, when his parents are heading back to Nazareth from Jerusalem. He stays in Jerusalem, stays in the temple. He's teaching the priest and the teachers of the law. They're amazed by his teaching even then as a child. And what does he say when mom and dad show up and say, what have you done? Where have you been? We've been scared to death, all of that. What does Jesus say at that moment? He says, didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? Do do, do you see that in this passage and then Luke chapter 1, it it shows us that Jesus was in church every time the doors were opened. He couldn't help himself. He loved the Lord that much. He's modeling for us our commitment to gather together and to learn from God's word. That church is important. It's not an option. It's a commitment that we're called to make. Can I say this to parents? If you've got a child, you need to understand they're going to learn more from what you do than what you say. And if you're not committed to church, if you in any way uh, display to them that church is kind of an optional thing, then you can expect their commitment to church to be even less than your commitment to church. And I just want to warn you, I've seen that over and over and over again in the lives of various families. You need to learn from Jesus and his example in this passage. Now, the synagogue was central to Jewish society. These verses confirm what history tells us, that the teaching, the explaining, the preaching from God's word was central in the synagogue. How would it happen? Well, they would invite a local rabbi, which is a local teacher, to come. They would give him the scriptures. He would open the scriptures. He would read from the scriptures while standing in honor of the scriptures. Then he would give it back, and he would sit in the teacher's seat, and there he would expound upon them. He would explain them to God's people. That's exactly what Jesus was doing here as a rabbi, as a teacher. He's doing that very thing here. It's very important for us to understand that this mirrors what had happened in, among the Jews from Ages ago, back in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, we're told what happened when, ne- uh, when Ezra, I'm sorry, uh, reinstituted the Old Testament law upon Israel's return from captivity. What does it say? It says that the priests read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Do you see it? When we gather together as a church, we study God's word, we come to understand God's word. We're valuing God's word. We're making God's word central to us being followers of Jesus Christ. And we value God's word and we value each other so much that we prioritize church in our lives. Not because we're made to go to church by God, but because we get to go to church We get to go, we get to worship, we get to focus our minds and hearts on God's word so that it changes us from the inside out. And that's what Jesus is doing here as the Jews had done from back in the Old Testament. Even though he's not sodded out, Jesus is a celebrity preacher who gets invited to speak wherever he goes. When Jesus showed up in the synagogue, they were like, okay, uh, you know, turn to the other rabbi. We love you. You're next week. Jesus goes this week, right? He was one of those kinds of preachers, right? Well, it's interesting. Jesus didn't seek out celebrity. It kind of came to him. And we're warned here with what happens that sometimes being a celebrity, being famous, is not all it's cracked up to be. There's a danger to it, right? There was a study done of Generation Z. You say, well, what's that? Well, you remember Generation X? There was a lot of talk about that. Generation Z means children till up to about, uh, what, do they, what do they say, Kelly? Up to about preteen, right? Something like that. Well, they did a survey of these children, and they simply asked them, what do you want to be when you grow up? And overwhelmingly, two answers were at the top. They were like 90-something percent. Everything else was down like a 20 or 30 percent. And the two answers were what? I want to be a famous online social influencer. 
number one. That was number one. They wanted that more than anything else. And the second thing is, I want to be a famous professional athlete. Do you see that we're raising a generation that is idolizing fame, idolizing popularity? It's really why there's an epidemic of young girls attempting suicide right now. It's because they are looking to be affirmed by the internet and social media. I'm just going to say this. This may not be popular. It's fine if you disagree with me. I'll love you anyway. Social media, oh my goodness, parents, get your kids off of social media. I'm telling you, it's dangerous. There's literally an epidemic of young girls trying to commit suicide because they're seeking their worth from the fame that they can get on social media, for the affirmation they can get on social media. I'm telling you, fame, popularity can be dangerous. Winston Churchill knew this. He was, someone came up to him once and he said, uh, and they said to him this, doesn't it thrill you to know that every time you make a speech, the hall is filled with people? This was his reply. Yeah, it's, it's, it's quite flattering, but whenever I feel that way, I always remember that if I were being hanged instead of giving a speech, there would be twice as many people there, right? And that's the truth. How quickly we take the famous, we build them up, make them super popular, and then we love to tear them down. It's not all it's cracked up to be. That's the truth. And our passage shows this, doesn't it? But there's a second thing I want you to notice, and that's this. We must adjust our expectations to Jesus, our Lord. We must adjust our expectations to him, not him adjust his expectations to us. We see that in verses 17 through 21. This is the heart. This is the message. This is his sermon In these verses, Jesus quotes from Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 2. And what you need to understand is that was an accepted messianic prophecy. As soon as he started reading from Isaiah 61, they knew that his sermon was about the Messiah. He was teaching on the Messiah when he was reading from that passage. But he does something interesting. He doesn't read all of verse 2. He stops before it says in Isaiah, and the day of God's vengeance. Now, why would he do that? Why doesn't he include that? I mean, Scripture is right there in Isaiah 61. It's simple. He was saying that the Messiah's message is good news. He was emphasizing good news news. And this is confirmed because he adds from Isaiah 58, 6, when he says to set the oppressed free. That's not in Isaiah 61. That's Isaiah 58. He, he, he ends by identifying himself as the Messiah. What does he say? Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. He's saying, he's saying, do you hear this messianic prophecy? Here I am. Bold. Bold what Jesus does right there. In his sermon, Jesus is announcing his agenda as the Messiah. What's he going to be about? What's he going to do? He points them to Isaiah 6 and Isaiah 58. And there's two questions you and I have to answer if we're to understand his sermon. If we're going to understand his agenda as the Messiah. Now, I'm going to say this too. Some of you may not know that Jesus Christ is not Jesus' name. Jesus Christ means Jesus the Christ. Christ is just another word for Messiah, Savior, okay? People were looking forward to a Messiah, a Savior, a Deliverer. They were looking forward to a Christ coming. That's the Greek word, Christ coming. So Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Deliverer, and he's saying, as your Savior, this is my agenda. First question we have to ask is this. Who are the poor? Who are the poor? Jesus says he's been anointed. That means he's referring to the Holy Spirit. 
having filled him, empowered him, that he's been anointed for ministry, this ministry, messianic ministry. And the primary phrase from this, this reading of his, what he reads in Isaiah 61, is to preach good news to the poor. So we got to figure out who the poor are. The good news is the very reason for his ministry. He's saying so. I've got a message from God. It's good news for you. That's the reason for his ministry. But then, who are the poor? Well, the scriptures repeatedly explain to us that the poor are those who recognize their need for God. Who recognizes their need for God? You might say, well, but it talks about the poor, you know, and we know what the poor are. So, so what, how does that work out, Daryl? Well, some, well, first of all, There's more than one way to be in need, okay? And the first, I would say, is this. Some are in need because they lack resources. This is what we typically think of as being poor. They lack resources. They they don't have all the resources that they need, right? And what do these inevitably do? They look to something or to someone to help meet their need. So they're the poor. There's definitely, they would definitely fit within this definition of the poor. But then there are those who go further. They may or may not lack adequate resources, but they recognize that they're spiritually needy, that they need God and what only God can provide in their lives. And this is the point. This is what I want you to to understand here. Our need while negative, presents an amazing spiritual opportunity. Your need, we tend to think of being in need, need of more of God in our lives, need because we're, we need God to provide for our practical needs. We tend to think of that as a negative. No, it's an opportunity for faith. It's an opportunity to trust in God. It's an opportunity to draw closer to God, for God to draw you closer to himself. Our need, while negative, presents a spiritual opportunity in the lives of those who will believe. How do I know this? Well, if you go to the Beatitudes, that's Luke chapter 6. There are two uh, verses that kind of seem like they don't belong together, but they do. So in Luke 6, chapter 20, there's that familiar verse that says that Jesus said, blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Now, very few people who are in need will say, man, I sure am blessed, right? That seems to not make common sense. Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. But if you skip down to verse 24, Jesus says something else. He says, woe to you. Woe means great sorrow to you. Woe to you who are rich, for you have already received your comfort. Do you see the danger and the opportunity? The danger can be in the resources we have, whether it be people resources, expertise, or material goods, because we tend to go, I got everything I need. And we become comforted or comfortable. But there's an opportunity for those who are poor, whether they're practically lacking resources or they just recognize, I need God in my life. I need more of him in my life. The phrase the poor also referred to something else in Jesus' day. (coughs) It was used... (coughs) In Jewish society, a shorthand for those who are social outcasts. What do I mean? Well, those who found themselves on the margins of society because they lack social status. So the poor included the forgotten, the overlooked, and the downtrodden. It, it, here's the thing. Though the Mosaic law taught the worth of every man, woman, and child, that they're equally worthwhile in God's sight. This was often forgotten. I think it's still true today. We do it too, I think, at times at least. There was a hard and fast social hierarchy 
that had developed in Jewish society defined by power and privilege. What do I mean? Well, your social status was determined, first of all, by your religious purity. You kind of expect that in a theocracy where God was king and everything centered around worship of Yahweh. But it also was determined by other things, like what? Well, your family heritage. Were you born into royalty or into poverty? Were you born in the right tribe, born in the right location? Then land ownership. Land ownership in an agrarian society was the only way that you had wealth of any kind. It was determined by your vocation, your trade. Why? Because there was no such thing in that society as rags to riches. That's Americana, the idea that you could raise yourself up by your bootstraps. Nope. If you were born in a caste of society, in a strata of society, you were born there, you lived there, you died there, and your children would do the same. Okay? It was, it was determined by ethnicity. Was your blood pure enough? Could you claim to be totally of the blood of Abraham in their case? It was determined by your gender. Women and children were considered property and of less value. It was determined by your education that was available only to the upper castes of society. And it was determined by your age because the elderly were often neglected or taken advantage of. That all means this. Things were not as God intended. If you look at the Mosaic Law, things were not as God intended among his people. And God was acting through Jesus the Messiah to remind men of what? That he values God values every woman and child equally. And that is good news. Because we tend to kind of, you know, put people on different levels. You know, there's some people, they're really close to God. God must love them more. And there's some people, they're really far from God. Well, God must love them less. No, the good news of the gospel is that God values every person equally. <clears throat> it doesn't matter what you have or you don't have. It doesn't matter where you're born or not born. It, none of that stuff matters. That's all what society tells a person. And this was revolutionary. You need to understand, when Jesus said this, said this, it was like setting off a bomb in that synagogue. Because Jesus was not just critiquing. He was rejecting the norms of his culture, the things that the listeners in general didn't even think about. They just accepted it as being true. Can I tell you that sometimes you and me, we have to reject and at times even oppose cultural norms. What do what, what, what I mean? Well, there are unbiblical worldviews. And you know they're unbiblical because why? They reject the gospel or they even oppose the gospel. What are two examples? Well, we've got some in society today. But there are examples of people rejecting God's message, rejecting and opposing the gospel, and rejecting God's design for humanity. We see that in critical race theory, which teaches people that your worth is determined by your status in society, particular, particularly the race you happen to be born to. But then you also see it with this transgender movement, which says you're defined, your worth is defined by your identity, and you get to determine it. And by the way, the most important part of your identity is your sexual proclivities. And so therefore, change who you are, deny what God created and designed you to be, and just do what you want to do. But that is in opposition to the good news of Jesus Christ. And we need to understand that. Luke's gospel has already emphasized the good news message from God. Uh, it was a message to the poor, to the socially downtrodden, telling them that God was coming in Christ, in the Messiah, to deliver them. Where in Luke? Well, look back at Luke chapter 1, verses 52 and 53. What does it say? It says this, God has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. And then in chapter 2, verse 10, you remember, you all are familiar with this. God speaks to the shepherds in the fields. And what does he say to these very common lower caste peasants? He says to them that I'm bringing you a message of what? Of 
good news that will bring joy for all people. In other words, the gospel, the good news embodied in Jesus Christ is for every person. It doesn't matter how you were born, where you were born, what you got, what you don't. That's good news. And Jesus, in, by, by reading from Isaiah, is confirming that he is going to tear down the dis- human distinctions in society and that he is going to remove the walls of division that are there. Why? Because God has said that he loves every person, every man, woman, and child, and that's good news. So, we've answered who are the poor. We need to answer another question. Who are those who need to be set free? He adds that verse from Isaiah 58, right? Well, Jesus' ministry will be to proclaim freedom to the enslaved, but who are the enslaved? When he took that part of Isaiah 58 and he added it to his sermon he ends up mentioning freedom twice that's a Greek word aphesis is the word and it means freedom or release okay that same word is found in the Greek Old Testament the Septuagint in Leviticus 25 when it speaks of the year of jubilee in other words Jesus's message is that he will set people free from bondage, bondage just like he did during the year of Jubilee. So what's the year of Jubilee? Leviticus 25 tells us that the, year, that the year of Jubilee was celebrated every 50 years. And we got nothing like it in our society. Because every 50 year, years, that year, those who had hired themselves out as indentured servants due to their debt were set free, automatically set free. You see, in other words, there was a debtor slavery that was present in Jewish society. But every 50 years, you knew that the slaves were being set free. That was really important. It also said that all land, all um, inherited land, family land that had been sold in order to pay off debt, that it was returned to the family, to the original owners. That was a returning of wealth to people who needed it. Most importantly for us, though, the year of Jubilee was about the fact that God himself was canceling all debts, that he was declaring that all debts were paid. He was paying off every person's debt in the year of jubilee jesus is saying that he has come to pay our debts and you might say well what debt what are you talking about well remember that old praise chorus jonathan he paid a debt it 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 explains it about as easy as i know he paid a debt he did not owe talking about jesus he paid a debt he did not owe i owed a debt i could not pay I needed someone to wash my sins away. And now I sing a brand new song, Amazing Grace, the whole day long. And this is the clincher. Christ Jesus paid a debt that I couldn't pay. That's the debt that we owe as a result of our sin. The year of Jubilee provided freedom from the enslaved, and it pictures for us forgiveness of sin that Jesus Christ brings to those who turn to him. In Christ, the believer experiences freedom from sin's bondage and the forgiveness of our sin debt. How do I know that's true? Well, Paul explains in Colossians 2, verses 13 through 14, what does he say there? Listen to this. This is a key verse. You might want to underline Colossians 2, verses 13 through 14. Because it's a great summary of what Jesus did through his life, his death, his resurrection from the dead. It's a great summary of the substitutionary atonement, which is the core of all Christian belief. Colossians 2, verses 13 through 14. I see some people turning. I'm going to wait for just a second. Colossians 2, verses 13 through 14. It says this. Jesus, the gospel is all about Jesus. Jesus forgave us all our sins, having canceled 
And it depends on which translation, what it says. The charge of our legal indebtedness. That would be the slip of paper that an accountant would write a debt on. Okay, The charge of our legal indebtedness. Another translation says the certificate of our debt. Jesus forgave us all our sins having canceled the certificate of our debt which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Do you know what that means? That means that the good news, that the gospel message for you and me is that Jesus paid the sin debt of every person who will trust in him. Jesus paid that sin debt. God is spiritually freeing every person who repents of their sin and entrusts themselves to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's what happens when we're saved. When we're saved, we recognize that we have a sin debt that we owe, and that sin separates us from a holy God. But we believe what the gospel tells us, that Jesus on the cross received all the sin, all the guilt, all the shame for every person who would trust in him, and he atoned for that. He paid for that sin through his suffering, through his death, and then gave us victory through his resurrection from the dead. That's the gospel, folks. Jesus has come to pay off your sin debt and my sin debt. I was witnessing to a person just the other day, and I asked them if they understood the gospel. And they were really upfront. They said, not really. So all I did was talk about this. Sin has broken the world. It breaks and condemns every person. That's not God's will. That's not God's design. Sin is an, ab- an abnormality. It's, it's, it's not what should be. And Jesus, God loved us so much that Jesus came, lived the perfect life we couldn't live. And then he went to the cross and he paid for our sins. He paid our sin debt to remove our sin, to remove bondage from sin, so that we might have freedom to do what? To know God and love him fully. To experience his grace. To receive forgiveness of sins. To be reconciled to holy God. You got to understand, guys, sin, your sin threatens to separate you from a holy God now and forever. In fact, you're already separated if you haven't turned and entrusted yourself to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. You are separated from God by your sin. It's not so much that God's going to have to throw you in hell. You're separated now, and if you don't turn to Jesus as your Savior, you're going you're gonna to be separated from him forever in a place called hell that he created for the devil and his demons. In other words, every person is condemned by their sin apart from Jesus Christ. And Jesus is saying, I've come to pay off your sin debt so that you might be reconciled to a loving heavenly father who has done everything that you need to be saved. You must simply turn from sin and self and entrust yourself to Jesus as Lord and Savior. That's what happens when somebody gets saved. They literally just say, God, and, and, and it's more than just saying it. It's not a ritual or anything. It, it, it's a change of heart where they recognize I need God's forgiveness. Sin is separating me from God, but I'm going to turn from that and give myself to Jesus. I need him to be my Savior and Lord. I need what he did on the cross to be for my sins. I know he died so that Salvation is available to any man, woman, and child, but yet I must repent. I must entrust myself to Jesus as Savior and Lord. That's the good news message, that God has made salvation available to each man, woman, and child. But we must personally make that commitment, that decision, to allow Jesus Christ to be our Savior and Lord. And when that happens, then we're reconciled to a holy God. Well, you see the end of the story, and this is the warning. The hometown folks, they reject Jesus, but when they do, they reject God's plan for mankind, God's plan for them. 
And if we reject what Jesus did on the cross, we have nothing when we stand before a holy God. And we can stand up there and we can say, look at all my good works. Look how religious I was. Look how faithfully I attended church. Look how I gave or whatever it is or did good things in the community. And God will say, no, no, there's one thing. Did you believe in my son as your savior? Did you turn from sin itself and entrust yourself to Jesus, my provision for your sins? And that's the question before each and every person today. Are we going to reject Jesus and God's plan for our lives, which is that we might be saved? Are we going to turn away from God's goodness and trust in self and continue the way that we're going? Or are we going to repent and turn to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Jesus is setting out his agenda, and his mission was to provide salvation for every person who would believe. My question to you this morning is very simple. Will you entrust yourself to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord? Will you make that commitment to him this morning? Will you recognize his mission, recognize what he did through his life, his death, his resurrection from the dead, and will you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior? You can do that this morning. I'd love to talk to you in a minute. The worship team's going to come. I'll be down here. I'd love to talk to you. I'll do it now. I'll do it this week. You give me a call. I'll come to your house. I'll, come to, I'll go to the coffee shop. We'll meet. We'll talk. I want to show you how you can know that you can be saved and forgiven of your sins. Have your sin debt paid for. I want to show you how that can happen. And I hope that you'll do that. Maybe you've got a different decision to make. Maybe you need to join this church or, or be baptized. Or maybe you just need to bow your head and pray and talk to God because you realize you've been taking your sin lightly and you need to repent again. Repentance is a way of life for believers, okay? Maybe you need to repent again. Whatever it is that God is calling you to do, would you respond to him and his message this morning if you'll stand?
Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. We thank you for these songs that we have sung. The, we have been able to sing our faith, to sing of your amazing grace, to hear your word proclaimed in this place this morning. God, help us to take what we've sung about and what we've heard today and to share it with those around us. We would share the good news of the gospel. Lord, we are so, so grateful for your amazing love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.